Good morning, everyone. Yeah. So assume that you are in charge of the data center, and then on a Friday evening, you are ready to go packing up, and then you see there are server alerts you are getting that there are data center is getting down, and then you go and see what is happening, and there are fans not running, it's heating up due to power issues, they are <clears throat> shutting down, temperature issues it is shutting down. And if you go and try to find out what is happening, there is an attack. So to recover that, you have to go through the uh, annual process. So how do we solve this issue? So that's what we are going to talk about. So I am Madan Santaram from AMI, Engineering Director. And then I have my colleague. I'm Jean Guillory from Intel. I'm a principal engineer. Yeah, and my colleague Prasanna Raman, uh, he w uh, worked on this presentation. Uh, he couldn't join us. So in a typical uh, server environment or any, any system environment, we have uh, OAS application layer, uh, middleware, database, everything. And then we also have a firmware and hardware. So till now, we were concentrating on security for OAS, antivirus, um, kernel patches, those kind of things. But we need, we need to secure our foundation with the firmware and the hardware. So that's why the industry is working to find firmware vulnerabilities and then patch it, and you need to uh, recover it as soon as possible. So the solution to that is we need to go for uh, hardware root of trust. So the firmware vulnerability, if you see the history here, that uh, currently, recently, you see the number of firmware vulnerability it is being found. And then uh, recent days, it's more and more. And then <clears throat> we need to have a solution for that. So the solution is we need to implement hardware root of trust. So basically, what is hardware root of trust? We need to protect, detect, and then recover. And then we need to stop the server being running if, if there is no way to recover. So protect means during BIOS BMC running state, and you need to uh, prevent any unauthorized access to the SPI, SMBAS, where there is a chance of attack. So detect means during power on, you need to make sure all the firmware is very good, and then uh, you need to do the integrity check cryptographically. If there is a integrity check issues, you need to recover with a recovery copy. Now, let me hand it over to my colleague. Great. So, so uh, one implementation that we have uh, that we created at Intel as a, a reference is Intel PFR. Um, we created it on Intel FPGA, and uh, this is uh, an architecture diagram of how the platform root of trust looks. Um, we can see uh, it has the, um, the connection through the spy mux to both the CPU flash and the BMC flash. And that is how it can authenticate the firmware that's on the flash and also do a recovery if needed. Um, also, you can see here there's connections to, um, in green, there's various SMBus components. Um, so if you have you know, components on SMBus that have configuration that's critical to the system performance but doesn't uh, have any sophisticated security properties, we can filter the traffic going there to, to keep an attacker from being able to you know, crash your system by messing with those. Um, and then also here in orange, uh, there's the PCIe endpoints and the connection uh, to the platform root of trust. And that's how we can use SPDM to verify that the, those are authentic devices and that they're running the firmware that you want them to run. So this is a little bit more about the architecture of the FPGA implementation of PFR itself. Um, these are all the, uh, the RTL blocks. We have the, the crypto accelerators there. Um, we also have the, the spy drivers and the spy filters, uh, as well as the SMBus relays and filters and the, the mailbox. Um, as well. Uh, we, of course, have the configuration space uh, and also some, some uh, data there for, for other secure storage. Um, and, and, um, and then 
all of that, the RTL that we have for PFR um, is, is open source. It's on, on, on GitHub now. We're working uh, to get the latest version on the OCP GitHub. It's not quite there yet, um, but it should be very soon. Um, so, uh, so all of those pieces are open source. And then we have the NEOS microcontroller, um, and we run firmware on that as well, which we also are open sourcing. Um, and so, uh, and, then, and then in our reference implementation, we, we create it so that it can interact with all the, the other protocols, all the other firmware on the server that we have, like your, your open BMC um, and stuff like that. So, uh, so that's the, the solution that we put out. And then we open source it. Um, so that you know, it, any anybody else can take it and customize it to suit their needs, and, and Tectagon is is one version of that. And so, Madan is going to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, we just saw how we can do the implementation in FPGA. Now, as a my uh, firmware vendor, we have a Tectagon hardware root of trust uh, firmware stack, and we have an open source version of that that we contributed to OCP. Now, the advantage with that is. You take this HRAT implementation and then port it to any silicon you want and then achieve the full feature hardware root of trust. So what we contributed that is a full stack that is ready to go with your BIOS and BMC. So if I need to explain the architecture here. So the top loan, what you see is the Tectagon OE HRAT application. So that application is uh, uh, implementing all the hard uh, HRAT functionalities specification uh, of, so currently the implementation we have is the Intel PFR 2.0, where it is going to handle the manifest, going to uh, do the protect, detect, recover functionality, verify, uh, and support the update functionality and all. So what we use as a HRAT core here is the Microsoft uh, uh, Cerberus Azure library, where we are, it, it implements the standard interfaces for the HRAT, and we use that and we implemented the application there. And below that, what you see is the AMI middle layer. So this is the layer that is going to interface between, uh, between the SDK that comes from the silicon vendors and then works with the Cerberus library. So what you see in the below, the bottom layer is the HAL and the Zephyr OS. So this sample impl implementation is based on AST 1060. We have a demo in our booth. So you, you <coughs> ESP provides those SDK. If you go to any other silicon vendor, uh, uh, who supports uh, uh, cryptographic-based microcontrollers or FPGA, where you just need the HAL layer and then their, uh, their environment where you can build it, and then you can port the middle layer and then take the Cerberus library and then our Tectagon OE application and then have the HRAT solution in your platform. So to just talk about some uh, HRAT state machine here, typically, uh, when you power on, the hardware root of trust is the one that gets the power, and then it is going to initialize its component. It's going to access the SPI, make sure, uh, does the integrity check of BIOS and BMC SPI. That is the verify phase. If it is uh, finding some corruption or something, then it's going to go into the recovery phase. It's going to re-verify it. So assume that both recovery is not good, uh, so active is not good, and recovery is not good. Then it goes to the lockdown space. That is the stop one that we are talking. So it's better to uh, shut down the server instead of executing with vulnerability. Then uh, if everything is good, it's going to go into the idle loop, like it's going to let the BIOS and BMC to run. And there may be uh, update requirements coming. So the firmware packages a capsule that will be given back to HRAT, and then because both active and recovery region in, in control of HRAT, and then uh, you cannot directly write to those area. So it will be uh, given to the HRAT. HRAT is going to verify the update capsule, and then it's going to update the active or recovery area. And then uh, we also have I2C communication going on between the BIOS and the BMC so that it can perform some attestation functionality, provisioning functionality like that. Now, let me hand over to how, how now we explained how the HRAT can be implemented, how to adapt it in a server. Right, so this is just a little bit about how the HRAT works. Um, this is the runtime flow of the server. Um, and you can see uh, that 
where the authentication and recovery happens is very early in the boot process. So basically you apply power and this comes up right away before your other components uh, that are, that even that run on the aux power are out of reset. Um, so we do the authentication, everything passes, then, then we hand over to reset or if not, we do a recovery and, and then we can continue boot. And so then the other devices boot, first your, your, your BMC and then you eventually your, your CPU boots up. Um, and, and during that time, we, the HROD is, is still active. It's still protecting the SPI interface um, and it's protecting the SM buses um, and it's waiting for, you know, if you have some command come in like a, a update, for example, and then uh, you can securely update the firmware on the system. So this is a little bit about how we do the firmware updates. And so uh, we use a capsule for a firmware update image. And so what happens there is your, you know, your, your BMC, for example, can stage the firmware update that's, that's in the sign capsule format and let the HRAT know, hey, I've got a firmware update, you know, go check it and, and, and update it. And so then the HROT will go out, read the firmware update. If everything's fine, then we, we, start, we, we store this compressed. Um, so basically, so we don't have to store empty pages, right? So we store it compressed. And, and then uh, if the authentication passes, we decompress it. We put it on the active image. Uh, and then, then we let the system start booting it. Um, and we can, can also do this to the recovery area. So if you want to um, update your recovery firmware, we do the, a similar process, but, uh, but, but we, we check that the active image boots first with, with that, that uh, update candidate. So you can make sure that you're not you know, updating to something that, that, that isn't a good image. Um, and now just talking a little bit about how we sign these and how we do the authentication. Um, so PFR, we have a, a two key hierarchy. Um, the first is the root key, and that's the key that gets provisioned. It's the it's public key. Uh, it gets provisioned into the root of trust at your manufacturing time um, and, and, and stored there uh, in, in, in a way that's not, not overridable. Um, and then that authenticates a code signing key, the CSK key. And so uh, the CSK key is what you use to sign your, your firmware images or your update capsules um, and, the, and your, your manifest, things like that. Um, and so that, that allows it for a few different things, right? One, one use case is if you want to, you know, you say you're, you're a CSP, but you have different vendors providing different pieces of firmware, then you can use a root key to authenticate the code signing key and then just allow your vendors to sign all, all the, their firmware, right? So, um, so you don't have to manage that. Also, uh, the code signing key is, uh, it, it can be canceled, right? Um, and, and so we have, have 128 key slots basically for these code signing keys. Um, and, and so if you, you know, if you want to change vendors, for example, and you want to cancel the, the key for your old vendor, you can, can do that. If you want to uh, just, just, you know, use some new keys because you've signed a lot of firmware updates, then, then you can do, do that. Or, 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 or if you have a security issue with one of them. So for various reasons, you can cancel the key. Now I'm going to hand it back to Dan. Yeah. So uh, like, like my colleague spoke, uh, we have a dual key, key hierarchy. There is a root key and then the code signing key. Now, during the HRAD provision, once the HRAD is provisioned, the root key is not allowed to be changed. So the, the, all the key change need to happen in the code signing level. So when do we change the root key? When you really repurpose the system. So out of your data center, maybe once in five years, six years, you, you decide to upgrade your servers you still, there is a secondary market out there. So when you give out your server out, it is easy to pull out the hard disk and other data easily. But what do you do with the firmware? So there is some still sitting on the uh, motherboard there. So that's where the decommissioning process comes into picture, where there is a separate decommissioning capsule that you use that, and then you, your firmware secrets, everything will be destroyed. And then it goes into the bypass mode. So that means when, uh, once you decommission your server, you run it, it does the bypass mode, there is no PROT functionality, and then it just does the BIOS boot uh, power on uh, like a regular CPLD. So then the customer, the secondary customer who is getting the server can again reprovision it and then have enable the HRAT functionality. 
if they need. So let's talk about uh, some of the runtime protection that we were talking about. So we have spy protection, there is SMBus protection. So spy protection really means like, in your firmware, typically a BIOS, take BIOS or BMC, there will be different regions where you have a code region, you have a data region, you may need to store a backup images. So code region, typically read only. So that means you need to do the read transaction. You cannot write it. If you write it or erase it, it's an attack. So if there is a data region where you store your configuration, you need to allow read and write. And then you have a recovery copy. The host application or BMC has no reason to see that other than HRAT. So that means you should not allow reading and writing. So that means there are three different configurations we need to support. So the spy filtering is the way to enable that, where you configure the manifest to say, okay, this region is only read-only. That means it, it, it snoops the spy traffic, either snooping or pass-through mode. The silicon supports that. Then any write access coming to the read-only region will be blocked. So that is the protection that we are talking. Similar way, there are uh, for the SMBus uh, filtering, there are commands uh, allowed for your uh, peripherals, and during update process, you cannot just uh, allow that because there is a firmware update packet going on. So the firm during update process, we need to do those things securely or during boot time and all, where uh, any external uh, uh, communication is not controlling that SMBus controllers. Uh, then during the real-time operations, we need to uh, allow only the uh, specific commands where that particular peripheral was expecting so that nobody tampers that firmware. So we also have uh, SMBus mailbox where during runtime you need to communicate with the BIOS and BMC, the HRAT need to communicate. So the design that we have is based on Intel PFR here where uh, SMBus mailbox is implemented where uh, 256 uh, uh, byte register is there. The each register serves a certain purpose. You can read certain data or you can write and make the HRAT to do something. So that is there and you can refer the specification for more detail. So in summary, uh, platform security cannot be uh, implemented just uh, open sourcing the firmware. Now we have the firmware, now you need to adapt that and choose the silicon that you want or if you want to take it as it is, adapt to the silicon that we support today. And then we have contributed our full firmware stack to OCP, uh, try to make use of it. Yeah, and so, so for Intel PFR, we're also contributing the specifications and, and the latest version where we're working on getting that into the, the OCP database uh, right now. Um, and then that's going to be compatible with the, the, the BIOS and the, the BMC uh, firmware as well. So, uh, yeah. And then our call to action, uh, basically just, just keep developing secure platforms and, and, and keep coming up with you know, new, new ways and contributing it back and, and get involved in, in the open source and, and, and work with us. Uh, yeah. So, like I mentioned before, we contributed our Tectagon Open Edition sources into OCP. It is live now. You see the link here. And we are not stopping here. We will be working uh, to support uh, features like platform attestation and uh, exploring more possibility security features in future. So, please work with us and then support HRAT in all your servers. Thank you. Questions? Questions, yeah. You, you, uh, hi there, I'm Steve from Google. You implied this, but I want to make it explicit. Um, does the customer, in this case, say I'm customer, have to maintain physical custody of those, of the hardware root of trust uh, from the moment that the root key is impressed upon it until it's destroyed? That if, if I lose physical custody at any point, I could be compromised. So, so the key that gets provisioned is, is, is a public key, right? And, and so if at, at any point, you know, it, 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 the firmware that gets loaded on that system isn't, isn't going to be able to get loaded without the corresponding private key, right? So you have to, don't lose possession of that private key. Um, but otherwise, you know, if the system's out there, it's, it's, it's your public key. I mean, I, and I think we actually store the hash of the public key, right? So it's, um, you don't, don't really have to keep possession of it. It's just that no one else is gonna be able to update it, right? 
Yeah, in, in addition to that, like if it, based on the silicon feature also, so if you use a microcontroller, there is a OTP area. So you provision uh, with one time key, and then it has a secure boot functionality where you cannot have other firmware running in that un unless it is validated. So you cannot go and then modify the secure say, OTP area or uh, provision new keys and all. So you have to go through the decommissioning process if you want to change that root key, otherwise it is secure. I apologize if you said this and I just missed it. Um, curious about the decommissioning flow. Uh, it, it seems like a flavor of ownership transfer. I'm curious, like, do, does it require uh -huh. like an authentic, like a signed token signed by the current key to say, hey, unlock Co the dope? Correct. Yeah, so it will be the, the decommission capsule signed by the root key because we don't want the code com uh, uh, the code signing key to be do the, doing the decommissioning. So typically, uh, OEMs wants uh, or the uh, real manufacturer wants the root key. Uh, and then the ODMs can own the uh, code signing key based on the different manufacturer that you have. So the decommissioning is a decision made by the, uh, the particular platform owner who owns the root key and then they can decommission it. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, uh, our question is that for example that we only talk about that to uh, the action on UEFI or BMC. But there are other firmware on the system. So for example, system CPLD or HPM or PG. For this kind of where uh, firmware is always not mentioned. So what's the consideration on this firmware? Yeah, so that's why in the end of the slide I mentioned about SPDM and attestation flows in future. So typically uh, we will be able to uh, access the BIOS and BMC supply. That's where the HROT concentrate. If, you, if we can improve this to be the platform root of trust, that, that means it has to support attestation uh, uh, using SPDM. It need to have, uh, have the attestation flow uh, to perform the protocol. So actually we have a demo there where we are performing the attestation of the peripherals uh, using our uh, other version of hardware root of trust. So the, the plan is to support SPDM in future. Uh, besides the SPDM to mm. uh, challenge this kind of protocol, how about to use I2C to verify the firmware directly? So, so yeah. we, you know, we do have that that kind of um, thing for for kind of devices that that, that don't support the full SPDM. So I, I, I talk about the only the CPLD and LPG, so not the maybe. PCA device not in power. Okay, power. Uh, when you talk about CPLD FPGA, so t typically if you bring in the update flow of the CPLD through the hardware root of trust, the issue is solved. So today, if you do a physical JTAG update, or if you if you uh, do directly out of band update through BMC, now it is not secure. Of course, the CPLD may have the secure boot capabilities, but if you bring the update through CPLD, through, through HROT, where any we can define a staging area to perform those update, and then uh, you can do it, and then through using I2C flow, you can update it. Definitely, we can achieve security there. OK, thanks. Uh, in fact, our, how some of our customers asking this kind of question. Also, we have some Im implementation. We can have more talks on this kind of thing. OK, thanks. Sure, yeah. If I understand right, it looks like HROT is implicitly trusted here. I'm just wondering, is there a way you can attest HROT portion of the solution? Yeah, so so with the, the PFR code that, that we're working to, to upload, we, we do support SPDM both as a, a requester so that we can attest devices, but also as a responder, right? And so it has its own DICE engine in there. It makes its own, own, own keys and can respond to requests. So, you know, say if you had a verifier sitting outside the system and you want to make sure that that, that system is secure, then, then you can, can send an SPDM transaction. We envision this happening like through a BMC or something, and then, and then you can send the information back to the verifier. And, and we're working on you know, kind of full, full solutions to implement that, that whole flow, but, but we do support that responder capability, right? So that's, you know, that's how, how you would do that. I have other question. Uh, thank you for that explanation, yeah. makes sense. Um, looks like when you refer a chart, you are referring to 
specific, uh, root of trust is very complex, right? So there are multiple uh, roots of trust and some of them vaguely defined. Uh, it looks like you are mainly focusing on root of trust for update, if I understand correctly, updating the new firmware and also um, integrity, right? Root of trust for integrity. Um, right, and for recovery I'm as wondering well. wondering you have any identity aspects or any other other things. So you need root of trust for identity and a bunch of other things. So can you? So it, it's, we, we, we can depend on this. Uh, so like, like my colleague explained, the uh, SPDM attestation is one part. And then the silly, based on the silicon that you use, it, it, uh, the modern silicon has dice capabilities, and there is identity for the silicon that you are using. And then through SPDM, you can see those identity and then uh, make sure it is a proper route of trust that you are working with. Similar terminology, are you guys collaborating with uh, the Calyptra? Or how do you contrast this XRT with the IRAS and those, those things? Sure, so uh, Calyptra is new to us also. So from what I understand, it, it is mainly for uh, IRAT in the SOC. So this is a hardware route of trust that is going to take care of the platform. Definitely it will integrate with uh, SOC to attest the SOC because that is a replaceable component and we can attest that and then make sure, hard, uh, bring it uh, even the CPU uh, attestation as part of our uh, uh, trust integrity zone, yeah. Sorry, so the follow up is so I'm assuming you were contributing those pieces, you guys will be working together or you know, this is like one time contribution and no, no, so th this is contribution made and we will be maintaining it. So this uh, particular Tectagon OE will be maintaining it and then we will be adding new features like SPDM. When we have SPDM, we'll see where Calyptra takes us and then, yeah. Any other questions? All right. All right. If there's no other questions, then we can wrap it up. Thank you. Thanks everybody.